Well, um, why don't we kick this off? Um, can I get a volunteer to take some notes for me? I can do that today. Thank you, Derek. Um, if I can just find the tab, there we go. Um, cool, so I wanted to start us off with a quick update on releases and other things that are going on. Um, so uh, we're in the middle of the, the development cycle for 3.17 right now. Um, we have uh, picked a date for that, which is um, in uh, mid to late November. So probably looking at the week of the 16th in November for that release. And uh, the main areas that we're working on there, um, there are, a few improvements coming in for uh, Windows BGP or Windows support that um, we released in the last release, um, including support for BGP networking. So uh, in the first release, that was just the XLAN networking um, and other fixes and improvements related to uh, additional platform support. So we're um, doing a bunch of testing of the Windows integration on uh, OpenShift and, and Rancher and, and other platforms. Um, the other uh, exciting thing that we're doing in 317, which I hope to show you a little bit of later, is um, automatic MTU detection. Uh, so we'll be adding the ability to, to determine what MTU to use for pods based on host networking configuration. Um, so that's all really cool stuff. Uh, there'll probably be a bunch of other smaller uh, bug fixes and stuff in there as well. And we did also just cut a couple patch releases for 3.16. Um, which uh, included a handful of um, fixes, bug fixes to uh, the etcd to kdd migration uh, tooling. Um, and uh, support for specifying passwords on BGP uh, sessions. Um, I think that's kind of where we're at with releases at the moment. Um, Eric, do you want to talk a little bit about operator stuff? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, so the uh, what I'm talking about isn't expected to be in for three seventeen. I don't think, um, but uh, we have merged a um, a tech preview branch or is what we were called it was called tech preview migrate inst install uh, that where we were working on um, a lot of migration work uh, and the migration I'm talking about is going from a manifest based um, calico install to an operator based one um, so uh, this has been merged to master now uh, and it will uh, migrate, uh, it will look at the installed artifacts. So, you know, Calico node, uh, the um, Calico config, and Typha if it's there, and uh, uh, Kube controllers. It will look at those, how they're configured, and um, create a, an installation, or well, update the installation resource uh, with the correct config that it picks from those and migrate uh, migrate the cluster from the manifest-based ones uh, to the operator-based ones. 
Um, if it if it finds settings that it doesn't understand, it will block and and not proceed with the migration um, and and report that through Tigera status. Um, so if anybody wants to check it out, hopefully it will uh, it won't it won't break your cluster and it'll tell you um, what what it what it doesn't understand. Um, uh, so you can either fix it or just see that you know because the operator doesn't support everything so uh, there may be some things that uh, it would just not be able to migrate um, yeah so that's in master um, we're still making some changes to it um, uh, but the majority of it's there so some useful stuff i think yeah and and so i think Today, if you install the operator on a cluster that's already running Calico that was installed, um, you know, just via the manifest, it will still uh, install the operator version, but it won't know how to translate yeah. all of your existing config. Yeah, if you, did, if you did it right now, it would be on you to configure your installation resource to uh, be appropriate for your cluster to match the old one um, effectively. Um, but yeah, yeah, it would do it right now and it would, you know, migrate the nodes over. Uh, but yeah, you'd have, it'd be your responsibility to make the config correct. Do you want to detect environments like EKS or Rancher or whatever? Um, some we do, um, not all of them, uh, I don't believe. Uh, but yeah, like EKS we detect. Um, let's see what else, Casey, you might remember. Um, I think, uh, well, OpenShift for sure, but that's kind of a, a special case. Um, you remember any others, Casey? Uh, I just know that there are more now than the last time I looked at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and there, there's actually only a few cases where having that provide, I mean, the my, if you're ex migrating an existing one, that provider doesn't make a whole lot of difference most of the time because everything we need is in whatever configuration Calico node had. So having that provider isn't necessary all the time. Yeah. So um, I think that's all I had for the operator. Um, cool. Thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. um, is there anyone on the call who is prepared to talk about um, what's been going on in the Calico VPP project. I don't see the usual VPP folks today. Um, yeah, so they either. obviously couldn't make it for some reason. Um, so I can give a quick update. Um, the, there's work, a work in progress to implement uh, network policy. Um, it's coming along reasonably well, should be uh, code complete in um, two or three weeks is, is what I heard is the latest, which is uh, great. Uh, there's also some prep work for a um, talk at KubeCon um, that we'll be uh, recording shortly, um, including doing some uh, performance benchmarking so we can talk, talk more authoritatively about uh, how well it performs as a data plane, which is obviously where the, the big wins are, are, are hoped to be. Thanks, Alex. Um, I think that was everything. Were there any other updates or, or uh, yeah, updates that anybody wanted to share? If not, then let's talk about some uh, Caligo heroes. So I had 
one um, uh, a user, GitHub user, Wei Xiao Blue submitted a PR a little while back um, after previously raising an issue that uh, he was seeing some weird behavior where Calico is falling over due to a completely malformed IP address showing up in etcd. Um, and so I thought that's pretty weird. <laughs> uh, and the code should be protecting against that. He dug in uh, through several layers of investigation and found uh, a quirky little bug in the way we're doing our IPv6 um, conversion from strings to big ints. And for certain addresses, it would result in uh, those addresses uh, being incorrectly converted back into a byte array. And so you ended up with things that weren't IP addresses and places that there should be IP addresses. Um, and then he went and submitted a fix for that. Um, so I thought that was very impressive and uh, probably a pretty awesome bug fix. <laughs> so I just wanted to give him a shout out. Um, yeah, that's cool. It's always nice to see somebody dig in, get their hands dirty. Um, uh, I guess kind of along the same, uh, I wanted to suggest uh, Richard uh, Kovacs. I'm not sure if that's how you say his last name. Um, he submitted a, um, a route reflector auto scaling operator uh, for to addition to kube controllers. Um, I, I know uh, that we had discussed, pre or it's been discussed before about that it would be great to have something like that for uh, uh, large clusters that are scaling up and down to have that auto scaler uh, for a route for reflector. Um, so he. Yeah, he's been doing a lot of really good work on that. And I owe him a couple code reviews pretty badly. So. Yeah. I'm gonna try to <laughs> bump those higher up my list for sure. Yeah, cool. That's good to hear. I put one on the list. Um, Josh Reich DB is the GitHub handle. You know how these things work. Um, that's another example of a, uh, a user turned uh, investigator who um, dug right in and found a. Um, uh, a, a strange issue with the, the move to scratch uh, for our CNI installer container. So I, I think they've just figured out that their, their CNI directory is a symlink or something, and that's the root cause of it maybe. Um, but they they dug really deep and um, worked through the code and compared the um, the old shell script install to the new Go based install and pointed out like, oh, maybe this line of code is wrong, that level of investigation, which is, uh, again, quite impressive. Sorry, taking notes and nominating at the same time. Um, I wanted to nominate um, Brian McMahon, who's um, one of my coworkers at Tigera, who's been doing a lot of work, seeing if we can automate some of the um, stuff that we, as a collective whole, seem to waste a lot of time just doing over and over again, stuff around um, like pin updates and um, hopefully I think cherry picking and things like that so that um, I, I don't think it's open to the community yet, but you may see some commits in the commit log now that show like our CI bot named Marvin, just like committing changes all over the place and um, everything he's committing is stuff that we don't have to do by hand anymore. So that's really exciting. I, I can't believe uh, it's taken us this long to do something like that. And I'm glad Brian finally took the initiative to do it. So kudos. Yeah, I think it's been up there Richard, now for- Join. Oh, hey, Richard. He, he missed your groveling about PRs. Yeah, I was 
just lamenting that I haven't had a chance to <laughs> look at your PRs in depth yet, but uh, I'm I'm going to. I have them open in tabs in uh, Chrome right now. Uh, yeah, one of the things that Brian was doing that I have found useful is um, being able to tell the bot that I approve of this PR and when it's passed all its tests, just merge it. So I don't have to like do the review, wait 40 minutes for the tests to finish and then remember to come back to that PR. I know that's left a lot of PRs in uh, limbo state before where they've had approval, but didn't uh, didn't get merged. Um, any other shout outs or nominees? Uh, if not, then we can talk about any hot issues that people might have on the top of their head. Um, I was trying to pick my brain for this one and nothing was jumping out at me. I know there was one we talked about last time around um, API server connections, which was really buried deep down in the Go client. Um, but uh, I'm not aware of any progress being made on that yet. Sean, didn't you say that's in? Was that was there a fix for that in GoLang already, or or not yet? Uh, if if it's the same issue that I found in the Kubernetes issue tracker then they were saying this is, in order to fix this, we either need to do a lot of work in Kubernetes or we need to wait for a fix that is scheduled mm. for Go 116, which isn't okay. out yet, but is, is like the next release of Go. So when they move to Go 116, there should be a very easy fix for this. But until they do that, the workaround is really painful. And I think the Kubernetes team decided not to do the workaround in any more, they decided not to do the workaround in the client. Um, and instead they've worked around it in a couple of components like Kubelet has a workaround that just restarts Kubelet if this happens and things like that. So maybe we should do something like that or go 116 will come along and we'll be able to, we'll, we'll be able to set the flag properly to make it work. Okay. I was just wondering because I was looking at Go releases earlier, just a little bit earlier. <laughs> yeah, I think we just bump it up to one fifteen three or something like that, or whatever the latest one is. Uh, if there are no other issues that people want to talk about, then I can try to do a demo for you guys. <laughs> uh, oh. Turk, you'll have to stop sharing your screen now. Thank you. So can you guys see this terminal OK? Yes. Um, this is probably going to be half of the demo that I wanted it to be because I had some issues with my cluster this morning, but I think it's still useful. Um, so I want to show where we've gotten so far with the uh, MTU auto detection um, stuff. So I've got a cluster up on AWS um, and you can see here I've got some interfaces, different MTUs on them. Um, we've got our standard 9001 here for our 
primary interface. And I've installed my development build of this uh, MTU detection feature um, on the cluster. Uh, in this pane over here, I'm just logged into one of the nodes and I'm watching this file that Calico now produces, um, which includes the, uh, the MTU that it has determined it should be using based on what it's, what it's finding on the host as well as the configuration that um, it's, it's reading. Uh, so, um, when I say I've only got half the demo I expected, the other half of this is having the CNI plugin um, respect this file, but I seem to have broken my CNI build with the latest set of changes to that, so uh, it's not quite there yet, but at least we can see the detection bit. So right now I've got a cluster with um, IPIP enabled, uh, no other end cap types enabled. So you can see it's subtracting the overhead that it needs from uh, this, no, not that, this MTU on the host. If I were to do something like enable wire guard, um, we would see that as the config propagates, it will update that MTU that it thinks it should be using because WireGuard has a larger encapsulation overhead. Um, and similarly, uh, I should be able to adjust uh, uh, MTU of the of the host interface um, to something else. And again, we'll see that uh, reflected in um, the value that the Calico thinks it should be using. Uh, and that's just a periodic check of the host. So sometimes there's a little bit of a delay there. Um, what else? Yeah, so once once I've got the other half of this, the CNI plugin will start respecting this and you'll be able to uh, bring up and down pods and see that, you know, the interfaces that get provisioned inside of those have the right MTU set. Um, and then the other bit that I'm working on is uh, actually propagating that to already running pods so that if you you know, change one of these settings on your, your cluster, you'll be able to um, get that propagated through to your pods without needing to, you know, restart them all. Cool. Is it, uh, one thing I always wonder, is there, yeah, you know, like if there's a, a lower MTU in some hop in the chain between nodes, is there, I mean, that should all be handled automatic. I mean, we don't need to adjust the MTU we're configured with for that, right? Yeah, so part of the assumption that this implementation is making is that, um, you know, the host is configured properly for the rest of the network it's attached to. Yeah. But also, I, I think it should be fine because of ICMP messages and adjusting of the MTU dynamically. Okay. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so you should get an ICMP too big message back from a router in the in the fabric at the point where it transitions to a network that can't handle handle that and. Even if the router doesn't send one, then the TCP stack is smart enough to to kind of try smaller packets and see if they get through. It, it's a much slower process if you don't have a fast ICMP message coming back, but but it should get there in the end, depending on half a dozen syscatal settings and 
that sort of stuff. Well, cool. That's awesome, Casey. I think uh, I've been working on Calico for three years now, and I think whenever I first started, we were talking about AutoMTU. <laughs> Yeah, I think if you sort our GitHub issues by uh, oldest, like first first raised, automatic MTU detection is one or two. I think there's also maybe some OpenStack IP mobility issue floating around as well. But it's going to be uh, bittersweet to finally close this one off. It's the end of an era. I, I'm sure even with auto MTU, MTU will not lay down and die as a problem. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, well, that's that's all I had. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions or bits. I wanted to say. Uh, ICMP too big for some reason. I found it to be a very funny name for a message. <laughs> I can imagine some stuffy naming body trying to figure out what to call this message and just being like, ah, it's too big. When will, when will people uh, be able to get their hands on it, Casey? So I'm hoping to have it merge to master mm, end of this week or early next week. Um, and then it will be in a release for Calico 317, which is uh, mid-November. Cool. Are we thinking on by default, but you can override it as the approach yeah so it's um planning on making it do this auto detection by default when you install um if you've uh already set an override it'll take precedence so we won't you know uh blot over whatever config that you've you specified um yeah exactly what you said Great. Well, it sounds like that's everything. Uh, in that case, thanks everybody for coming and I will see you on the internet. Bye. Thank you.